Okay, shalom everyone. Can you hear me? Type a one if you can hear me. Uh, and let me put the link up. Okay, good. Uh, last week we had a little bit trouble with the, the sound. I got a new headset. I think it was a headset. I really think that was the whole issue. So hopefully this will take care of all of that. So um, tonight we'll be looking at Psalm 39, Part 2. And the, the study's title, Does the Lord Inflict Punishment for the Purpose of Drawing Us to Repentance? And I don't know if that really describes the um, rabbinic commentary portion of the, of the psalm because um, we're going to be talking about uh, Lashon Hara. And so um, before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together and that we can study your word, Lord. We just praise your holy name. Lord, we ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts tonight and help us to um, learn the things that you want us to learn, Lord, and um, apply these things to our lives. And we just pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so um, th tonight we'll be looking at uh, the rabbinic commentary, Midrash Tehillim 39. And there are four parts. And uh, we'll be looking at each part, part 1, 2, 3, and 4. And... The the majority of the the midrash, it appears to be when looking at you know all four parts, that the rabbis are really discussing the topic of lashon hara, and so um, it's what's interesting is that when looking at the midrash to get the perspective of the rabbis on uh, regarding the um, gossip or, or the evil tongue, and so um, and how how they approach it from different angles, how they look at it from different scriptures and everything. And, and so I um, had a lot of fun studying this topic tonight, and uh, we should hopefully tonight here. And so on, and the link there is to www.matsadi.com, and the PDF file is at the bottom of the page. And we're starting on page 11. And on page 11, I have page 11 and 12, uh, I outline Part, actually, we're looking at part one, two, and four, not part three. And um, I thought we were looking at four, three as well. But um, I outlined part one, two, three, and four. And um, we look at the the Dibur Hamat heel, the opening word or phrase, the Petita, the homiletic introduction, the Mashal, which is the um, the parable, the Nimshal, which is expansion on the parable, and then the concluding phrase. And so. Um, Midrash Tehillim 39, Part 1. It opens with the Debor Hamat heel, that opening phrase or word, and it says, For the leader for Jeduthun, a psalm of David, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. And so the rabbis, they're quoting David's words from Psalm 39, Verse 1. The homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it says that David's meditation is to be considered in light of what scripture says elsewhere. A soft answer turns away wrath. The grievous be wait a minute. Um, the grievous words stir up anger. And then they quote from Proverbs chapter fifteen verse one. And so David says that he if we if we think about what is written in Psalm thirty nine verse one, he says that he will heed his ways so that so that he does not sin with his tongue. And the rabbis say that this may be understood elsewhere um, by what is written and they make a reference to one who speaks with another person regarding answering with a soft word versus a grievous word and uh, have you ever answered anyone with a soft word or a, a harsh word and um, I know that you know, even with regard to my relationship with my wife with Brandy that um, even tone the type of tone that you have when you answer um, can can actually um, imply a harshness, a kind of harshness. And so um, the Midrash, it states that an evil tongue is more grievous than idolatry. And so when we think about this regarding the Midrash and what the rabbis are saying, why do you think that an evil tongue is considered more grievous than idolatry? Does anyone have any comments on that? Why do you think that an evil tongue is more grievous than idolatry? The rabbis in the Midrash, they appear to be taking 
in extreme and, and right Nathaniel it it creates evil and it cuts you are right exactly and it it can murder you know can commit murder you know because it can destroy you know our words can destroy and the rabbis they they seem to be taking an extreme approach and um, I know a lot of times I mean before I really got into um, studying Judaism and, and the topic of Lashon Hara, I never thought too much about uh, the the evil tongue or, or words exactly. Because you know, we know that phrase that we're taught as kids that sticks and stones can uh, break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know, but the, the truth of the matter is is that words really do hurt us. And um, yeah, and you're right, it can it can praise evil too, right? And the rabbis, when they look, when they're they're speaking in the midrash, they seem to take an extreme attitude towards the way one speaks to our fellows. Lashon hara, or the evil tongue, is considered to be one of the worst or the greatest crimes in society. Why do you think that the rabbis believe lashon, lashon hara is so evil? And um, you know, you guys gave a couple of examples here, but uh, they say that it's even greater than the sin of idolatry the serving of other gods. And that, that's pretty significant, if you think about that. That is really significant. And when thinking on this, what do you think Yeshua thought of Lashon Hara? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? What did Yeshua teach on Lashon Hara? We know that he raised the bar, or the standard, with regard to Lashon Hara, in a sense that even our thought life will be brought before the judge of heaven and earth. And um, remember what he said in Matthew chapter 5 regarding murder and lust. That if you uh, hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. And if you lust for a woman, you've already committed adultery. So Yeshua kind of raised the bar with regard to our thought life. Yeshua also warned us likewise saying that every careless word we speak will be brought before the great judgment. And he said that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 26. So Yeshua thinks pretty, uh, pretty well along the lines that the rabbis are, are thinking here um, with regard to uh, Lashon Hara. And the Midrash, when we're looking at Midrash Tehillim 39, part 1, it goes on to, pre to provide the answer for uh, regarding why Lashon Hara is considered more grievous than... Uh, than idolatry. And it says, and I quote from the Midrash on page, uh, top of page 13, and it says, in the wilderness, when the children of Israel sinned and made the golden calf, it was only after they had sinned with their mouths that the decree of their punishment was sealed. As is said, the Lord heard the voice of your words and was angry. And they quote from Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 34, and as is also said, as I live, says the Lord, Surely as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. And they quote from Numbers chapter 13, verse 28. And then the Midrash goes on. It says, Mark that the verse does not say, You have wearied the Lord with your deeds, but says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. And they quote from Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. And so, in this portion of the Midrash, the rabbis say that at Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai, the children of Israel sinned, with the golden calf, and it was not until after they sinned with their mouth that the decree of their punishment was sealed. Why do you think that is? Now, I think that's pretty interesting that they, they make that conclusion in the Midrash with regard to the sin of the people of Israel and the golden calf. And in Parashat Kitisa is where we find this, uh, this narrative, and the Torah tells us that Moshe remained on the mountain for 40 days and in Exodus 24, verse 18. And after having been gone for 40 days, the people say in Exodus 32, verse 1, they say, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so the people say that they did not know what was to be of Moshe, what had happened to him, because he had been gone for 40 days. And so they demanded Aaron to make 
for them a god upon and upon seeing the idol is interesting to note that in the in the um, parsha and from the torah that they proclaim this is your god o israel who brought you out of egypt and in Exodus 32 verses 1 through 6 it's interesting to note that the thing the people do with this golden calf they ask for a God to be made with man's hands and declare with their lips, lips that this is the God that brought them out of Egypt and following the making of the golden calf Aaron speaks and he speaks with his lips again and he says that tomorrow we will be well, tomorrow will be a festival before Adonai and uh, note here that he uses the, the that Hebrew word, the yod heh vav -Heh. So he's using the name of the Lord and in reference to this golden idol. So the people rise up the next day, and it says that the people sat, ate, drank, and they raised, to pl raised up the play. You know, raised up the play. And the people, basically, they had table fellowship with their God of their own making, and which is a for, known as a form of uh, intimate relationship. When you have a table fellowship with someone, we're having an uh, intimate relationship with them. And, uh, inviting them over for a meal, you know, inviting them into our house. And, and um, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 34, Moshe reiterates the Exodus journey and states that then the Lord heard the sound of your words, and he was angry and took an oath. And, and in the Midrash, it goes as far to say that it was not by their deeds, but by their words that caused the Lord to become angry. And um, they ate with a golden calf. Great a guest that does not eat much. Yeah, uh, you know, they, yeah, they're right. You're right. Um, they invited a, a the uh, the golden calf to eat with them. You know, if you think about that, and um, he doesn't eat at all. <laughs> Has mouths that do not speak and eyes do not see, see ears that do not hear. You know, and so. Um, the Midrash, it goes on to say that it was not by their deeds, but by their words that caused the Lord to become angry. And what is it about our words that outweigh our actions? What do you think? And um, Shalom, Patricia. It's good to see you. And so what do you think? Um, what is it about our words that are so weighty, you know, over our actions? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, the Apostle James said in James chapter 3, verse 6, that in the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And so that is pretty significant. You know, James is saying that uh, the, the tongue is an evil thing and that it, it's set on fire by hell and it can set the entire body on fire by hell. In the rabbinic literature, the evil tongue is described as being a source of all plagues and is worse than shedding blood, sexual immorality, and idolatry. And we can find this in the Mishnah Erechen 15b, uh, Midrash Rabbah Deuteronomy 6.8, in Pirkei de Rabbah Eliezer uh, 53, in Bava Batra uh, 164b. And so um, in, in these rabbinic sources, we learn that uh, the evil tongue is described as the source of all plagues and is worse than shedding blood, sexual immorality, and idolatry. And it appears that uh, the Apostle James, or Yaakov, uh, held a similar opinion regarding Lashon Hara and the tongue. It is a world of unrighteousness and it is set on fire by hell. And it's interesting to note something that he's describing here that the tongue is a world in and of itself and this reminds us of a previous study that we had on the Psalms I forget which Psalms it was but um, this with regard to a world within a world and the rabbinics understanding of our lives being a world because of the unique the uniqueness of each individual and the rabbis say that anyone who embarrasses his friend in public is as though he has shed his blood and all of this is connected to the idea of Lashon Hara. A possible reason why the rabbis say 
the evil tongue is the worst of sin is because our words come from our heart, which is the center of our being and our actions. And so the children of Israel saw the work of their hands and were glad in their heart. And they said, uh, and then they say that in, in the, the Torah portion in Parashat Kitisa, they say that uh, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And so uh, it, it was that with their mouths they were confessing something that they believed and then that they followed through with on the next day. Um. Nathaniel, you say that is the difference between those who committing but not committing sin? What do you mean? Um, I guess the parallel I was trying to draw here with regard to Lashon Hara and, and with what Yeshua had said was that even if we do not act upon that sin, if we, if like with regard to lusting for another woman, that then it's as if we have already committed the sin of adultery in our hearts. And so it, I don't believe it matters whether we actually physically do or if it's just in our mind. You know, I think both instances need to be repented of. And so um, in, in the, the Midrash, it continues and it says uh, the following, and then we're on the top of page 14. It says, similarly, it is written, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. And again, my heritage has become to me as a lion in the forest. She has uttered her voice against me. Therefore, have I hated her. But does the Lord hate Israel, his heritage, because of her voice? Rather, does he not love her because of her voice? As it is said, let me hear the song, or sorry, hear the voice. And they quote from the Song of Solomon 2.14. The fact is that he loves her because of her voice and he hates her because of her voice. So then that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that was from uh, Midrash Tehillim 39 part 1. Again, that was another portion. And the rabbis, they state that Jerusalem lay in ruins because of the tongue and their doings against the Lord, quoting, and they quote from the book of Isaiah. And they say from Isaiah chapter 3, verse 8, that for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. And so Isaiah says, because of their speech, or their, their um, and it says here in, in the Hebrew, Leshonam, uh, because of their, their tongues, their speech, and the way that they walked suggests the way one speaks follows through by the way one walks. And so the children of Israel had Aaron build them a golden calf in Parashat Kitisa, and the words of their lips indicated their desire and plan to walk in sin before the Lord at the mountain of Sinai in the desert. And so their words were a form of premeditated sin, and it was something the people had planned to do. So the Midrash then, it concludes saying that the Lord loves his people by hearing their voices. Saying because of her voice, he wants to hear her praises, her song, and her singing, etc. And so from the biblical text, the Lord loves her because of her voice and can be angry with her because of her voice. And the idea is that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so then the question is, do we guard our tongues enough today in our lives and in, in society? What do you think? And think about this for a moment. The harm done by speech is even worse than the harm done by stealing, by cheating, or by cheating, as in the case of losing money, the harm done by speech can never be repaired. And so our words go out and kill like killing a person in our heart. And they steal, like robbing a person of their joy. They, it destroy, our words can destroy, uh, for example, the result of words that are able to permanently destroy relationships. And um, there are two mitzvot that deal specifically with improper speech. In, in Leviticus 19, verse 16, it states that you shall not go up and down as a talebearer among your people. In Leviticus 25, verse 17, it states that you shall not wrong one way. You shall not wrong one another. And which, according to Jewish tradition, refers to wronging a person with speech, as is Lashon Hara. And um, 
Let's see. And Nathaniel, you say that so like the rabbis told we can participate in the creation process or destroy with our tongue. And you know, that's that's a good point, I think. That's a really good point. Because when if you think back on re with regard to the each individual person being a world, an individual world, that when um it's possible to destroy a person, you know, and even to the point of uh, like causing someone to commit suicide. You know, we've read that of of uh, teenagers taking their lives because their friends are being mean to them. And so um, I think I think uh, that's that's a good point that our tongues can be creating in the sense that building up and strengthening and increasing faith or destroying. You know, that's a really good point. Shalom, Sherry. It's good to see you tonight. Okay, so um, that concludes part one of the Midrash. Uh, anyone else, anyone have any questions regarding part one? Okay, I'll move on. In Midrash Tehillim part two, it opens with the Dibur Hamat heel, and it says that, the opening phrase or word, it says that, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue, and they quote from Psalm 39, verse 2. So again, they're looking at this verse and uh, the homiletic introduction, the petita, to the uh, Midrash, it says, I happened once, it happened once that a king of Persia was about to die. And as he grew exceedingly weak, his physician said, there can be no remedy for you until they bring you the milk of a lioness, which you must drink until you are healed. And... So Midrash Tehillim part, uh, 39 part 2 appears to be a really long parable. We look at that Midrash, it's just one long parable regarding the king of Persia who is about to die. And so um, the, I quote that parable on page 14 and 15, so we'll read through that. And uh, the Midrash, it says the following, it says, uh, it happened, oops, I just killed my app. Okay, I got it back up again. <laughs> okay. It happened once that a king of Persia was about to die, and as he grew exceedingly weak, his his physician said, There can be no remedy for you until they bring you the milk of a lioness, which you must drink until you are healed. So the king sent servants who took much money with them to Solomon, son of David. Then Solomon sent and summoned Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, whom he, uh, whom he aside, how can we get, he brought aside, so how can we get the milk of a lioness, he asked. And Benaniah replied, give me ten female goats. And then Benaniah and the king's servants went to a lion's den, in which the lioness was giving suck to her whelps. The first day he stood afar and threw one goat to her, which she devoured. The second day, day Benaniah came a little closer and threw another goat. And thus he continued day by day, and at the end of the ten days he was close to the lioness, so that as he played with her, he touched her dugs and took some of her milk and went on his way. And then the king's servants went back to Solomon. He dismissed them in peace, and they went on their way. And while they were midway to their journey, the phys physician who was with the king's servants had a dream in which he saw the parts of the body arguing with one another. And the feet were saying, Among all the parts, there is none like unto us. Had we not walked, he would not have been able to fetch any of the milk. The hands replied, saying, There are none like us. Had we not touched the lioness, we would not, have, we would not now be carrying any of the milk. The eyes said, We are of greater worth than any of you. Had we not shown him the way, nothing at all would have been ac accomplished. And the heart spoke, saying, I am greater worth than any of you. Had I not given counsel, you would not have exceeded, succeeded at all in the errand. But the tongue spoke up and said, I am better than you all. Had it not been for speech, what would you have done? Then all the parts replied, saying to the tongue, Are you not afraid to compare yourself with us? You are lodged in a place of obscurity and darkness. You indeed 
in whom there is not a single bone such as there is in all the other parts. But the tongue declared, This very day you are going to acknowledge that I rule over you. And as the physician woke up from his sleep, he kept the dream in his heart and went on his way. He came to the king and said, Here is the milk of a female which he went to get for you. Drink it. And immediately the king got angry with the physician and ordered that he be hanged. And as he went out to be hanged, all the parts began to tremble. The tongue said to them, Did I not tell you this day that there is nothing to you? If I save you now, will you admit that I rule over you? And they said, Yes. And then the tongue said to those who were about to hang the physician, Bring me back to the king. And they brought the physician back to the king, and he asked the king, Why did you order to have me hanged? And the king replied, Because you brought the milk of a female to me. And he asked the king, What does that matter to you if, will, if it will cure, cure you? Besides, a lioness can be called a female. The king then took some of the milk and drank and was healed. And so since it was proved that the milk was the milk of a lioness, the physician was dismissed in peace. Thereupon all the parts said to the tongue, Now do we confess to you that you rule all the parts. And of this is written, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they quote from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. And so David declared, I said, I will take heed to my words that I sin not with my tongue. And that was from uh, Midrash to Helim 39, part 2. So, we look at this parable that the, um, the physicians are saying that in order for the king to be healed, he must drink from the milk of a lioness. And what's interesting about this is that the, the physician specifically specifies that the king must drink the milk of a lioness. And why do you think the physician chose the milk of a lioness and not that of a goat or a cow? Anyone have any ideas on that? Um, I, I had an idea, and it just, this, this had just come to me uh, when I was going through the, the parable, that it could be that the physician saw the king's illness was so great that he decided to put forward an impossible task. And so the king would eventually die, and he would, um, and he would not survive with his... And, and, and then the, uh, the physician would survive with his life. And so... Um, Oh, Sherry, you say the lioness is a hunter of the pride? I haven't heard that before. Huh. And, um, but I felt that a lot of times the, when a, a physician was in the service of a king, that it's possible that if a king wasn't healed or if he died of his illness, the command would be given that uh, this physician must die too. And, oh, that, that's, that's neat, Sherry. I didn't know that, huh? And so um, the, the idea was that maybe, the, and I know this is just a parable, this is just an interesting thought, that maybe the physician said that you need the milk of a lioness in order to, um, in order to, you know, you know, you're right, lionesses don't like to be milked, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, and so... The, this impossible task of milking a lioness was given simply because it would have been impossible to do, maybe. You know, and, and so the king of Persia went to Solomon seeking his wisdom on how to get the milk from a lioness. And Solomon sends his servant, and his servant successfully milks a lioness and brings the milk to the king. And, as the, and it's interesting in the parable that as the physician is returning he has a dream and where the parts of the body are arguing with one another. And the arguing of the parts of the body reminds us of what the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians regarding the various parts of the body of the Messiah. And so, um, let me look at what was being written in the room here. Uh, So, okay, a lioness is the strength of the pride. So in her milk could be seen as strength, pride, courage, bravery, and the victoriousness in battle. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And so, um, 
I thought that since the 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 this dream is part of the parable talked about the various parts of the body arguing, we look at First Corinthians chapter twelve verses four to twenty seven, and I quote that on page fifteen and sixteen. And so let me read through that. It says that now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles into another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and it yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason, is it not, no, it is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, uh, it is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less, our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacks, and so that there may be no division in the body, and that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are a Christ body and individually members of it. Okay, so uh, and um, let's see. You would not interpret Lashon Hara. What do you mean by that? I'm not sure if you could explain that a little bit better. But um, it's interesting in Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12. It's interesting in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 verse 12. 15 to 23 speaks of the parts of the body with regard, with regard to the body of the Messiah, referring to the body of believers, and each is given a different uh, function. Paul discusses what would happen if the foot says that he is not a hand and therefore not a part of the body, if the ear says he is not an eye, and so I am not a part of the body either, and if the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell be, you know, etc. And what's interesting about this discussion is that Paul seems to be aware of the use of the parable in Midrash regarding the parts of the, parts of the body argument and uh, with one another, which is the greatest. And it's possible that Paul knew of this Midrash, yeah, maybe, yeah, I don't know, in, in Midrash Tehillim 39, regarding the various parts of the body that were arguing which was the greatest. And where the, um, the people in Corinth all desired to be preachers. It, it seems like when we look at this in 1 Corinthians, it, it may be that the people in the ecclesia, in that, in that congregation that Paul was speaking to, they all desired to be preachers or teachers or have the gift of healing or speaking in tongues or something or a specific gift. And uh, it's possible that some 
were suggesting also that there were different spirits giving different gifts, you know, because each one was a little bit different from one another. And the point that Paul was trying to make with regard to the body is that no one person is greater than the next. Each is to help his brother, and none is to esteem himself as being greater than the other. And that there was only one spirit through which all these, these gifts were given. And so the members of the body are to be good to one another. And Paul says in chapter 12, verse 26, that if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And as a result, all of Christ's body is given honor. And in, in the Midrash, Midrash Tehillim 39, part 2, uh, it has a slightly different approach uh, since the Midrash is speaking on the Debor Hamat Hill, that uh, opening verse in Psalm 29, uh, 39, verse 2, that says that, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. And so they're taking a slightly different approach to, with regard to the parts of the body arguing together like what Paul is saying uh, in 1 Corinthians as compared to the Midrash. And in the physician's dream in the Midrash, the feet, the hands, the eyes, the heart, and the tongue all speak together, praising themselves, saying that each one is greater than the next. The tongue, on the other hand, um, boasts that he has rule over all of the body. And so when the physician arrives, he tells the king that he has the milk of a female. And the king gets angry, presuming this is not the milk of the lioness, and prepared to hang the physician. And, be, and you know, as the, the, that parable went, that the physician, uh, then, before he was hanged, the body parts submitted and admitted to the tongue that he does indeed have the power of life and death over them. And note, it's interesting that the tongue causes the body to submit to its will. I thought that was an interesting aspect of of this uh, this commentary from Midrash is that the tongue seems to be causing the body to submit to uh, its will, like in like it says here in Parashat Kitisa regarding the people and their premeditated sin, and in Midrash, oh, you know, because they they declared what they were going to do and the next day they did it, you know, and so. In Midrash Tehillim 39, part 2, it concludes and it says, Thereupon all the parts say to the tongue, Now do we confess to you that you rule all the parts. Of this it is written, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so David declared, I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. And so David says that he will take heed to his ways, so that he does not sin with his tongue. And the taking heed of our ways, examining our ways, is something that every man should do. You know, man, woman, and child. And uh, with regard to um, sin and, and the tongue. And taking heed of our ways, examining our ways, is something that every man should do, like David's suggesting. And, and this is the way that uh, the ways of God is to choose to walk in faith, walk in the Spirit, in His truth, and not in error and in all the commandments, and in the ordinances of the Lord, blameless, and in the path of holiness, as, as the Lord lays out in His Word. And so we are to seek holiness, take heed not to embrace error, or to go in immorality. And uh, David says that, I sin not with my tongue, which is a world of iniquity. And it's interesting that, um, with regard to this idea of worlds, yeah, in, in the Talmud Bavli, uh, the Talmud Bavli uh, Sanhedrin 37a, it says that for this reason was man created alone to teach you that whosoever destroys a single soul, scriptures imputes guilt to him as though he had destroyed a complete world. And whosoever preserves a single soul, scripture ascribes merit to him as though he had preserved a complete world. And so according to the rabbis in Talmud Bavli Sanhedrin 37a, each person is considered an entire world. And we learn here that the tongue is also in and of itself a world of iniquity that is capable of all sorts of evils. And this is exactly what the Apostle James was saying you know, in, in um, his epistle. And the simple interpretation or the Peshat, you know, meaning for all this, is that um, it could be that we are to understand that the tongue 
can lead us into a world of sin and rebellion. We are, however, called to live moral lives and so that we walk, uh, we might walk in the ways of God. And what I, I was thinking that um, it's interesting that when we consider the tongue and the words of our mouths, that if we respect or honor people with our tongues and with our words, then uh, we are honoring the one who is created in the image of God and by doing so we are honoring God. And um, and yeah, I, I think so, Nathaniel. I think so that, that we are in the place of or have the power to create or destroy. You know, and with regard, if we look at that, uh, the uh, midrashically, you know, with regard to the, a man being a world, you know, we are, we have the the tongue has the power to create or destroy a person. And when looking at honoring someone who is creating in the image of God, that if we disrespect, like an example I give here in the studies, if we if we disrespect our spouses, or you know, even anyone else, even our enemies, if you think about that, that uh, do we really believe the scriptures? And that God exists when treating so badly one who was and is created in the image of God. I think that's an interesting perspective, you know. And also, if we consider this aspect of lashon hara from the Talmud regarding each man being a separate world, that if we do not uh, watch or guard our tongues, there's a possibility of creating evil worlds, you know, creating. Um, in a sense of procreating uh, by reason of the tongue. And others, for example, others will learn by example to do, um, do what based on what we say. And what's interesting is that Yeshua says something very similar when he was speaking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in Matthew 23, verse 15, that he says that, um, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees and teachers of the law! you will make them twice the child of hell that you are. And so, Yeshua was, and I, I didn't quote the entire scripture verse, but I, I'm sure everyone knows where that is, or remembers that, that story line. But uh, the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were so strict in their, uh, their understanding and their interpretation that when they made disciples, their disciples would become even stricter, and uh, they would. And Yeshua calls them twice the child of hell, you know, making them worse off than what their teacher is. And so, another problem with lashon hara is that, with regard to making disciples, people will begin speaking like us or behaving like us. And I, it, I don't know about you, but the people we hang around with, you begin to behave like, you know, and you, you begin to mimic. And uh, I remember when I was younger that hanging around bad company will corrupt your language, you know. And I, it, all of this seems to make sense. And um, what did you say? Let's see, also the way that we say things gives a good or bad frequency, at least I believe. Yeah, you know, it, you're right, it does. I think it does, Nathaniel. Yeah, definitely. And um, and it influences others. Definitely influences others. So um, when when we think on these things with regard to lashon hara, do you think this is what Yeshua was thinking about when he spoke those words to the Pharisees? Yeah, right, Sherry. You are known by the company you keep. Exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucas is only hanging around me, so you know, hopefully he won't be too much like me. <laughs> I'm not that good a person, you know. I don't think anyone is, but the Lord will work on him, you know, works he's working on me. But anyway, so um that concludes part two of the Midrash. And do anyone have comments on that? I thought that was fascinating perspective that the rabbis are giving us here with regard to uh Lashon Hara. So the last part we're going to be looking at is part four. Midrash Tehillim thirty nine part four. And it opens with the Dibur Hamad heel, and it says that another comment for the leader for Judith, Jeduthun. Jeduthun refers to the profession of judges and their judgments. And um, that was the opening phrase. And then the homiletic introduction to the Midrash states, Therefore the psalm continues, I will take heed to my ways, 
and that I sin not with my tongue so as not to pervert judgment. And another psalm says, even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant does meditate in your statutes. And they quote from Psalm 119, verse 23. And so um, it looks like they're looking at, the, the Midrash is looking at the introductory phrase on Jeduthun. Okay, so the Midrash, this Midrash, this part four continues with the, the general theme of all of Midrash Tehillim 39 regarding sinning not with the tongue. And uh, therefore the rabbis, um, they add that perverting justice, and these things are then connected to the tongue in man's heart. And then the rabbis say that the wholesome tongue is a tree of life, and they quote Psalm 15, verse 4, a tree of life meaning Torah. And from this you learn that the Holy One, blessed be He, gave the Torah to the children of Israel, that they should not busy themselves with idle words, nor busy, or nor be busy with evil tongues. And so, one of the purposes of the Torah is to keep the words of this law on our lips and in our hearts, so we do not sin with our lips and uh, and in our hearts. And so, the idea is to get God's word in our hearts, so we do not have sin in our minds. And this is definitely a New Testament principle, you know, if we think about that. And, um, yeah, and out of the heart, the mouth speaks. You're right. right. And so then, as we've been learning in the Midrash, there is a connection between what we say and what we do. And remember that Isaiah said that the people's speech, their Lashonam, is connected to the way they walk, suggesting that the way one speaks follows through by the way one walks. And note again that the children of Israel had Aaron build them a golden calf, and the words of their lips indicated their desire to walk, and their desire and plan, their premeditated plan to walk in sin before the Lord at the mountain of Sinai in the desert. And it's interesting to note the opposite effect in the way that Eli kept silent about the way his sons lived. And it's interesting is that um, when we study this, David's words on keeping silent so that he's, he does not sin, that there are different things in the different people throughout the scriptures who kept silent. And we can see the effect of that silence. Yeshua kept silent before the Sanhedrin, before his crucifixion and his judgment. You know, and um, Eli here in 1 Samuel 2, 27 and 36, he kept silent with regard to what his sons did. And let's read that, and I'm on top of page 18. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27 36, and it says that, Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, or to go up to my altar to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me, and did I not give to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father shall walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. You will see the distress of my dwelling, in spite of all the good that I do for Israel, and an old man will not be in your house forever. Yet, I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, so that your eyes will fail from weeping, and your soul grieve, and all that the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. This will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day both of them will die. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. Everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver, or a loaf of bread, and say, Please assign me to one of the priest's offices, so that I may eat a piece of bread. Okay, and that was 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27 to 36.
Um, and so, the man of God came unto Eli, and he says, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choice of every offering of my people Israel? And earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we read the manner in which Eli's sons were behaving wickedly before the Lord. They would take from the choice of meat, and they would sleep with the women at the entrance to the, ta to the uh, tabernacle. His sons lived in open sin before the people of Israel uh, like this. And isn't it interesting how long the Lord tarries before bringing judgment upon them? The first thing listed in the scriptures was that they did not handle and divide the meat of the sacrifice properly. And so uh, let's look at these verses more carefully. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 to 17, and this is the top of page 19, that it says the following, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord and the custom of the priests of the people. When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling, and with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the fork brought up the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. And also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, He must surely burn the fat first, and then take as much as you desire, then he would say, No, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. Okay, and that was 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. And what's interesting when reading these verses in chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, 13, is what the scriptures say specifically. And it says that, and the custom of the priest with the people, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And so, the boiling of the meat and the taking of a three-pronged fork to remove the meat from the pot is said to be a custom or a mishpat, a, a judgment. And it's interesting that there's no Torah command regarding exactly how to separate the meat. And so it seems like they, they came up with this judgment, this mishpat. Um, yeah, in America we do say just silence is golden, that's right. Yeah. And um, or uh, my wife says tape is silver, silence is gold. <laughs> you know duct tape. And so anyway, um, and so it, it's interesting that there is no Torah command regarding exactly how to separate the meat. And so they come up with this um, this custom. And the scriptures continue. They say that Eli's son would demand his sons would demand the meat before the fat was removed for burning on the altar. And in Parashat Tzav. The Torah command is very explicit on how the meat was to be handled. In Leviticus chapter 7, verse 29 to 34, it says that the fat was to be burned while the breast and the right shoulder were to be given to the priest after they were roasted on the altar. And the sons of Eli, however, had no regar regard for the Torah command. Hophni and Phinehas looked upon the sacrifices not as a mean, means of worshiping God, but as something which was there for their own personal use and pleasure. And note also that the meat was there for their use. It was to be given to them. However, it was the manner in which they took the meat and neglecting the fat that was a sin. They boldly took from the meat that was set apart from the Lord as holy. And this was a blatant disregard for the command of God. And Eli, he did not speak up against his sons, neither did he remove his sons from their office of service in the tabernacle. And by Eli's example, keeping silent resulted in bringing God's curse upon his family. And whereas in other cases, speaking words brought God's curse upon one's family. You know, so you got like in Parashat Kititsa that uh, they spoke words of, of rebellion and sin with a golden calf and that brought the curse. And in Eli's case, he kept silent and that the curse, and so you can see that within the tongue again we find this this theme of uh, in lashon hara that uh, of the tongue having the power to create or destroy or um, 
you know, good and evil. And so um, David, he says that even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant does meditate in your statutes. And from Psalm 119, verse 23, and the rabbis quote from, from this psalm. And that psalm, it says, it's interesting, because let me read that again, verse 23 of 119. It says that even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant does meditate in your statutes. And it's interesting that to look at the opening verses to Psalm 119, because remember when in the Midrash, when the rabbis quote a verse or a portion of the verse, they had the entire section of verses in mind you know, when they're thinking about with regard to the Midrash and the study. And so when looking at Psalm 119, verses 1 through 6, it says the following, and this is at the bottom of page 19. It says, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do not unrighteousness, they walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. And that was Psalm 119, verses 1 through 6. So David is saying that the blessing comes to those whose ways are blameless and innocent and who walk in the Torah of the Lord, who observe his testimonies and seek him with all of their heart. And it's interesting to note that he says, um, he says the words, um, let me see. Okay. Yeah, he, said, he uses the word yidreshuhu, and it's from the word dirash. And that means to seek or to interpret which draws the context back to the Torah. Because the one who seeks God seeks his word. And to know or understand and interpret and apply God's word to one's life. And so our, you know, the question is, are you doing that in your life today? And David continues, he says that this person does not work in justice or evil because he walks in God's ways. He also says in Psalm 119, verse 4, that you have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. And it, this sounds a lot like what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And um, again, note the Psalm 119, verse 4. It says, you have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. And so in, if we look at the Hebrew translation of, the, um, of Ephesians 2.10, we see this word, ma'asim tovim, meaning good works. And the Lord God in heaven, our Father, our Lord God Almighty, our Father in heaven, He's prepared for us beforehand something that we are to walk in, is what Paul is saying. And these are ma'asim tovim, or good deeds. And this phrase ma'asim tovim is found throughout the rabbinic literature. And if you use the software, like the software I have, um, let's see, what was that software again? Uh, Judaic Classics Library. If you type in Maasim Tovim and, and you click on uh, the rabbinic commentary, the, the Talmud, you know, etc., all sorts of results come up for Maasim Tovim. So this is a, a phrase that's a, a used commonly in, in the in rabbinic literature with regard to uh, good deeds. And in the in the Talmud, it says. Uh, like in the Talmud Bavli in Avot 4.17, it says that self-examination and teshuva, teshuva with good deeds. And so the Talmud in, in uh, Avot 4.17 is speaking of our own self-examination, you know, examining our heart, uh, teshuva, which is repentance, and then ma'asim tovim, good deeds. And this is often used in the Talmudic expression denoting the mitzvot, as in the statement, one hour of teshuva with ma'asim tovim, with good deeds, in this world is better than all the life of the world to come. And the juxtaposition of these two things, teshuva, which deals with repentance and turning from sin, and good deeds seem to be, seem to be complementary. 
And so when, when we turn from the path of unrighteousness, we are to turning toward God and his ways and seeking to do good, do good towards others, um, good towards the Lord. And something to note, in two weeks is, um, is on Midrash Shehilim 40, on Psalm 40. And we talk at length on this aspect of Teshuva and, uh, and the Torah and um, you know the the purpose of the giving of the Torah, and uh, Maasim Tovim, and uh, you know, and so they, you guys, I really encourage everyone to be there because I really enjoyed Psalm 40, and especially the rabbinic commentary portion of it, in part two. That's going to be a good one. And so, um, but we talk about this repentance, turning from sin, and turning towards the Lord. You know, and and. Um, I won't say anything more on that. But um, when we turn from the path of unrighteousness, we are turning toward God, towards God and His ways, and seeking to do good towards others and good towards the Lord. And the rabbi's understanding of performance of the meat's boat is to be done so from the motivation to return the soul to its source, is what I've read in the rabbinic literature, and to God. And so Paul's words suggest that God is crafting us to abide or to live in Yeshua the Messiah, to do ma'asim tovim, to do good works uh, and good deeds, which brings connection back to the psalm and back to the Torah. As David says in Psalm 119, verse 3, they also do not unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. In verse 4, you have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently and 5 and 6 it says oh that my ways may be established to keep your statutes then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments and so in the in the Midrash the rabbis they quote from Psalm 119 verse 23 we read that a little bit earlier but here's the context in verse 23 to 27 it says that even though princes sit and talk against me your servant meditates on your statutes your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have told of my ways and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts so I will meditate on your wonders. And so David, he requests for the Lord to teach him his ways so that he can walk in them. David is so adamant in his request for learning God's ways that he requests that the Lord make him to know and understand his ways. And um, have you ever asked God to make you to know his ways? I know I have. And that's, that's, that's something that I want, you know. Because a lot of times I don't choose the right way. And it's interesting that David's use of the word... Uh, Pikudecha is derived from the root word. Um, it's let me let me type it out here. It's pe, oops, I'm not on that. It is pe, This word pakud and to command um, to command or be a captain over. Him And so David, he's using this word, asking the Lord to be a captain over him and with regard to making him to know or understand his ways. And um, so he's asking the Lord to lead and to guide him and, and to be a commander over him. And in Midrash Tehillim 39, part 4, it continues and it says the following on page 21. I have a portion from the, the Midrash, part 4. And it says that the verse means, however, that with words of Torah, so too it is said, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, a tree of life meaning Torah. From this you learn that the Holy One, blessed be He, gave the Torah to the children of Israel, that they should not busy themselves with idle words, nor be busy with evil tongues. So the psalm says, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. So too, Scripture says, these words you will speak them to them, that is, you will speak words of Torah, not slander, nor idle words. Likewise, David asked, Who wishes to have life in the world to come? 
And they replied, No man can have it. David replied, But, if, but it can be had, and at a low price. And when, when scripture, says, or scripture asks, Who is the man that desires life? Psalm 34, 13. The question means, Who is he who wants life in the world to come? And they asked, But how can one have such a life? David answered, By keeping your tongue from evil. That is, from slander, of which it is said, The lying lips are silenced, which speak against the righteous. Lips which prevent you from ever saying, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear you. And so, in the Midrash, the rabbis say that God, that God's word, his Torah, is to be kept on our lips for the purpose of giving life. Note that they say that we are to speak words of instruction rather than idle words or slanderous words. The sin of Lashon Hara is so great that David asks, Who wishes to have life in the world to come? And the answer is by keeping your tongue from evil, from slander, and from lying lips. The Apostle James emphasizes, is his emphasis in James chapter 3 warns that judgment is real and that we all stumble. He says we are to humbly repent of impure speech. He says the tongue has the potential for great for a great amount of evil rather than the potential for a great amount of good. And the capacity for evil is so great that it is a world in and of itself. And the tongue essentially spreads evil and there seems to be a direct correlation to the Midrash in Psalm 39, Midrash Tehillim 39, part 4, and um, it concludes saying that David answered, by keeping your tongue from evil, that is from slander, of which it is said the lying tongues are silenced, which speak against the righteous, lips which prevent you from ever saying, oh how abundant is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear you. And they quote from Psalm 31, verse 20. So, in keeping our lips from evil, from evil words, we essentially keep our hearts on a straight and narrow path. And so studying God's word is the way to feed the spirit and the way to renew our hearts. And of course, with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, that, that is accomplished. And so um, that's all I had for part four of the Midrash. And did anyone have any comments on that? So let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify you and give you praise. Truly, you are worthy to be praised. Lord, our lips were created for your pleasure, to give glory and praise to you always. Please have mercy and forgive us for the sin of our lips, Lord. Lord, help us to do what is right in the midst of this evil world. Empower us by your Spirit to do what is right, to speak words of life to our friends and our family, even to our enemies. And pray for our leaders, our brothers and sisters, and have wisdom for the purpose of seeking and growing nearer to you, Lord. Help us to know your ways and to have a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led life. And Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers and help us to treat all men with justice and righteousness. And Lord, we desire to live holy and righteous lives because you have separated us as holy unto yourself. You have shown us how to do this by your commandments and demonstrated this in your Son, Yeshua the Messiah. Help us to walk and abide in Christ as the scriptures say we are supposed to do. And thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Yeshua, that we may enter into the salvation that you have provided. We thank you, Lord, for these writings so that we can grow in our faith and to know who we are in the Messiah, Yeshua. Help us to grow by walking in the Spirit and applying these truths to our lives. Lord, we praise your holy name and give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll release the mic here.